Um, I have been very fortunate uh, during my scientific career to investigate uh, scientific phenomena that are absolutely stunning and, and beautiful. And today I want to tell you a little bit about uh, my latest uh, obsession, which is origami. And when we think about origami, many of us think about these simple cranes that uh, we as children folded. But origami today has become quite sophisticated. We know how to fold curved folds. We know how to make very complicated tessellated patterns. We know how to make curved surfaces with straight folds. And we know how to make very complicated shapes. This is one sheet of paper, one side orange, the other side green, folded into this snake wrapped around a scorpion. I come to the world of origami from a slightly different uh, direction. I'm interested in uh, something called metamaterials. These are materials that are structured on a medium length scale, bigger than atoms, but smaller than the bulk scale that we interact with them on. And these materials can be used to make um, objects that can uh, create chirality and light. They can cloak uh, objects by moving light around them. And they also have spectacular mechanical properties that we can uh, program in. And one of the uh, directions that we're trying to go in is to try to think about, can we start to make these types of metamaterials out of origami uh, systems? So why origami? And I'll include in this kirigami, which is uh, paper cutting uh, as well as folding. Why are we trying to make metamaterials out of these uh, uh, arts? And uh, the basic idea is that uh, when you start with 2D materials, we have a vast array of technologies that we've already developed that can be used to pattern these uh, materials. So everything that we've developed for the whole semiconductor industry to make computer chip patterns of circuits, all of this can be transferred to make folding patterns. These folding patterns can then uh, be fabricated, uh, made, uh, in roll-to-roll -roll fabrication. For example, here, we take one of these patterns, uh, fold it up on the fly, and all of a sudden, uh, you have a useful <laughs> piece of origami. <laughs> the origami structures that we make uh, can be quite complex. Uh, this is a folding pattern for this insect. Uh, we now have computer-aided design programs that can essentially take any shape that we want and fabricate a design for it where we know where the fold should go. In this particular case, you can see that the square sheet is broken up into segments. This might be a leg, here might be another one, this might be an antenna, and so forth. The other fascinating and important uh, uh, criteria here is that origami is scale invariant. And what that means is that we can make shapes folded up on macroscopic scales like this elephant, or the very smallest scales, such as these micron-sized uh, dodecahedrons that you see on the left. And so um, I think I can argue that shape is something that we know how to do extremely well with origami, but my lab has been trying to figure out uh, something about the mechanics. Once you make these shapes, what is their mechanical behavior like? What springiness or what stiffness can we attribute to these shapes that we make? So I want to take you through a little story to show you the kinds of things that we do. Um, this is just one of many, but I think it's illustrative of what type of contribution scientists can make uh, to origami mechanical metamaterials. So this is the Mura Ori tessellation. It is a very simple pattern that can fold flat. Um, it is used uh, especially for solar sail designs. The idea is that if you can compress it and then unfurl it, uh, you have a very compact payload that you can then spread out in space. Uh, these designs can be found in nature, in the hornbeam leaf and the embryonic villi. That's the stomach lining of animals. And what's fascinating about these materials is that if I take one of these sheets and if I take one of those valleys and pop it through, there it goes, into a mountain, if I now try to compress that same sheet, um, it becomes stiffer once I reach the level of that defect. Okay, so when the size scale of the sheet is on the scale of that defect, it is stiff. I would have to rip the paper in order to compress it any further. And what's further amazing about these defects is that they can interact with one another. So for example, 
If I take my sheet and I pop one defect here oop, and another one here, these defects, it turns out, have topological charge. It's kind of like electrical charge, pluses and minuses, and they can annihilate each other so that this sheet can fold flat again. In fact, I can make a whole array of designs, ones where these defects conspire to make a, a nice seam that I can fold, a little ridge, or in a slightly altered configuration, a rigid ridge that does not allow any folding. I can pop these defects in at will, like pixels in a computer program that essentially allow me to create any mechanical behavior that I want for this sheet, changing its stiffness, changing its uh, behavior on the fly. I was very excited about this result, and uh, I couldn't wait to share it with Mr. Mura himself, the guy who patented this particular pattern. And I was very pleased to attend the uh, Origami in Science and Mathematics and Education meeting in Tokyo uh, just last year. And this is uh, Mr. Mura uh, taking hold of the um, or origami wand uh, from the previous uh, uh, president of the society. And um, oh, OK, so I didn't actually get to meet him, but I did get to sit behind him. <laughs> so, and my student, Jesse, did get to meet him. So this is a photo from Jesse. Um, and, and so we were very excited about uh, this work, and, and this work was, was published uh, in Science. We were very excited about it. And about a, a week after it was published, I got a letter from this guy, Sadia Sternberg, and he sent me this picture. This is a picture of Lucrezia Panciatici. She is hanging in the Uffizi in Florence. And uh, this is uh, a painting uh, by Bronzino, uh, circa 1540. And what Sadia pointed out to me was that if you take a look at the yoke, and I'm a physicist, so I had to be explained what a yoke. A yoke is this part of the dress, is the upper part of the dress. Uh, Lucrezia's yoke is actually a Mura Ori pattern. And the difference in wavelength that you see when the pattern is quite wide and then quite narrow is punctuated by these uh, trapezoids here, which are essentially these defects that we d rediscovered. And so this sort of gives you an idea of, of how origami as an art form really borrows from the textiles uh, arts. And, um, you know, while Mura is, is old, he's not quite this old. <laughs> and, and so really he was copying designs that, that probably his uh, mother was sewing into his yoke that he was wearing as, as a young child. So we thought to ourselves, well, you know, if, if the textile arts can contribute to origami, maybe we can go the other way around. And so that started a, a little adventure that we went on, um, uh, Science on the Runway. Okay, I hired a, um, an intern, uh, Win Wen, uh, who is, uh, by the way, the youngest uh, board member of Origami USA. She is a very talented origami artist, and I got her to spend a year in my lab uh, doing an internship, and she hooked up with uh, Leah Frenny, uh, over here on the left, who is uh, uh, in the human ecology department at Cornell and a fashion designer. And they decided to create a line of origami fashion uh, that's sort of borrowed from the kinds of things going on in our lab. Here I'm showing you a Mura Ori pattern that is now uh, shaped into a circle, a washer geometry. This pattern is special in that the outside can shrink by quite a bit, but the inside stays the same size. So we thought, whoa, that's pretty cool. Maybe we can make this into a dress because the inseam, you know, the inside of the dress can't expand and contract, but the outside can flow. Um, we thought um, we could pop it into the third dimension and make some pretty attractive patterns. Um, we also thought maybe we could take some of the designs that we had for these uh, bellows, which have these nice transitions between the unfolded and folded state. Could we make those into some sort of purse uh, geometry? And so armed with uh, these ideas, we had a Kickstarter campaign by Wynne and uh, Leah, and we were able to get enough money for them to create a line of clothing and uh, attend the Vancouver Fashion Week. Uh, and let me just tell you that as a physicist, if you had told me that I would be attending a fashion show sometime in my career, I would have uh, said you were crazy. And also as a physicist, I tend to be quite dismissive of fashion, uh, mostly because as a physicist, I'm not very good at it. 
But I have to say that the conversations that we saw on those stages were, were quite profound and I think as interesting as any conversations that I've had uh, in my academic ivory tower. Um, let me give you a feel for what this was like. Uh, you know, five minutes before we went on, uh, the models were being put makeup on, the dresses had to be stitched so that it fit each particular model. I mean, it was complete chaos. But in the end, this was the line that we created. And you can see many of the uh, uh, origami patterns that uh, we made with uh, our dresses here. And also these purses. And I want to emphasize this purse here in particular because this really stole the show. We had our model come up front and take this purse and collapse it. Uh, explaining how you can really, you know, based on how much stuff you have in your purse, uh, <laughs> adjust its size to what uh, you need. So, so this is an example of, of, you know, trying to give back to, to the arts from uh, all uh, that the arts have contributed to us. Uh, here are Leah and Wynne taking a bow, and we really did get what I think, well, I'm a proud father, but what I think is the loudest ovation in the fashion <laughs> show. I want to take my last minute to talk about uh, one more concept, which is scale. I, I mentioned that origami is, um, in, is particularly attractive because uh, the concepts at one scale translate down to another. Uh, the first type of origami system that I want to talk about are these self-folding gels. On the left here, you're seeing a uh, Randall bird. It's about two centimeters in size. Right next to it, uh, what you're seeing is a gel sheet that is one micron thick. That's about a 50th of your hair diameter. And it's only a few hundred microns wide, only a couple hair diameters wide. And here it is folding by itself. And the way this works is that the, uh, this sheet is really three sheets uh, sandwiching one another. The middle sheet is a gel that expands with heat. So it can uh, change its size. But it's sandwiched between two flat, stiff sheets. And these stiff sheets are then patterned. You can see these lines in the patterns. And the idea is if, this, if these patterns are asymmetric top and bottom, so for example, if the top uh, sheet, you can look at me here, if the top sheet is wider than the bottom sheet, then what you get is that the gel expands more in the middle in the top part than the bottom, and you get a fold in the pattern. And that's how you create these self-folding systems. And I'm proud to say that uh, uh, for this particular pattern, which is the Randlett uh, New Flapping Bird, uh, we hold the world record for the smallest folded bird. Uh, this is a Petri dish. And this little speck right there, that is the folded bird. Uh, here it is, uh, blown up for you so you can appreciate it. I was, um, I was very proud of this, but I have to say that um, we only just beat the record by a smidgen. Here is a paper bird uh, shown on a one rupee coin and some very persistent, and I assume small folder, <laughs> was, was able to make uh, this tiny bird. Um, so this, this makes me very nervous because it's only a matter of time before somebody folds an even smaller bird. And so I thought to myself, well, what, what would be the ultimate limit? what would be the smallest thing that anyone would ever be able to fold? And the answer is um, a single sheet of atoms. So going from these gel systems, where we can make things on the 100 micron scales that self-fold, this is again that Muri Ori pattern that I showed, we now want to go to uh, graphene. Graphene is a single sheet of carbon atoms. Um, it is essentially one atom thick, which means that no one's going to be able to beat my record once I make it. <laughs> And the way you fold graphene is that you have to layer it with another material, uh, perhaps glass, um, which has a different coefficient of expansion. And if one of the sides expands more than the other, then you get a fold. And this is, in fact, what we're doing. And um, very recently, about a month ago, we uh, made our first successful pattern. So this, these right here are uh, thousands of these origami strips, uh, these graphene strips that have glass uh, beneath them. We can use a little pin to pick one of these up, and that's what you're seeing here. This is a little needle, and this right here is a single sheet of graphene bonded to 
two nanometer thick glass. And when we heat that needle up with a laser, we can get this to fold by itself. Okay, we're not gripping the graphene in any way. This is just heat folding the graphene. I'll play it one more time because this is the first time that anyone's folded graphene. And what this means is that when we get um, better at this, when we can start making birds or tiny structures that can, for example, carry on board power supplies and circuits that can measure their surroundings and report on them, we will start a, a new revolution of tiny machines, machines that we can fabricate in 2D and fold up into 3D that can be placed on cells to measure, spread in water droplets to determine you know, global climate change trends. These, these things are coming. Um, we're not there yet, but we're on the way. And um, I think that future is, is quite exciting and, and full of opportunities. So with that, I'll, I'll close and just say that this uh, nexus between art and science and art and science again has really been one that's been very fruitful in my life and, and uh, one that I look forward to continuing. Thank you. Thank you.